So Jeremy Harold, Sean Preston, and Andy Trotter are the three individuals who are joining us today. John Mahoney was going to join us, but he um, had an emergency at the last minute that he needed to attend to. Uh, but he works with Andy Trotter, and Andy will be able to cover John's component of the presentation just fine. I found all of these individuals when I was reading an article at the end of last year, and I revisited it this year when I was trying to figure out how do you put together a collection yard for urban wood, and I believe it was few trusts that wrote about each individual who's presenting today and what they're doing in their communities, and the way I set it up is I wanted to go from the um, small town perspective, although Harrisonburg may not consider themselves a, a, a real small town, but compared to the other models that you'll see today, it has a, a model that I think a lot of small municipalities will be able to embrace, perhaps on a startup basis tomorrow or next year if they wanted to. And then we're gonna move on to the medium-sized model for the city of Baltimore, which is Sean Preston at Camp Small, and then to the large business model, which is Andy Trotter um, for West Coast Arborists and Street Tree Revival out of California. So I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy, the green space manager for the city of Harrisonburg to talk and I believe you're able to talk it now, Jeremy, is that right? Or am I needing to do something on my end to give you the mic? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Yeah, thanks so much for having me this afternoon. I'm excited to be here. Uh, if you wanna yeah, advance to the first slide there. Um, yeah, so I am the green space manager for the city of Harrisonburg and I do consider us as a small city in the central Shenandoah Valley. Uh, we're about two miles or uh, two hours west of Richmond and two hours south of Washington, D.C., uh, right along Interstate 81. We are about, uh, we're about 55,000, and we have two colleges here in the city limits, James Madison University and Eastern Mennonite University. So with that, we have a pretty good uh, park system in, in, in Harrisonburg for the students, and we have pretty good tree canopy. Uh, with that, though, unfortunately, we had 14% ash in our park system. So in 2017, uh, emerald ash borer arrived uh, from Northern Virginia, moved its way through the Shenandoah Valley. And at that time, we really weren't prepared for what was about to take place, but we've had to remove 1,500 ash trees in our park system over the last five years. So that's really the driving force of our program. You can go to the next slide, please. So with that, um, I really didn't know what uh, Urban Wood um, was at that time. We go maybe back one. So I, I attended uh, Virginia Department of Forestry. Uh, we've been very fortunate with our Department of Forestry has been very supportive. And with our state coordinator, Joe Lennon is with us today. It's been awesome to mentor our program. Here, I attended a workshop in Richmond, Virginia. I met people from across the, the country, from Portland, Oregon, all the way. There's a really great guy in Charlotte area. If, if, if you're interested in looking up uh, in Charlotte, they have a re really good urban wood program there. So I met folks and and this is what it's all about it's just networking and finding out what works best in your community so with that um, i learned we went out to a park in richmond at the time and found out about portable sawmills and how to make lumber right on site in the park uh, at that time i was with the parks department so i brought these ideas back to harrisonburg and i would recommend if you're with a municipality to start a, re a project review team or a committee get different departments involved. We have Parks and Rec. I, now I'm with Public Works. Uh, the decision was made about three years ago that for me to move to Public Works to create a, a citywide program. We've involved uh, community development, our finance department, purchase, purchasing department, 
And the more people you can get involved um, and they know about your program, and then you can continue to build your program. Uh, just a little side note too, the, the Virginia Department of Forestry created the Virginia Urban Wood Group, and we have a state directory. If you border the Virginia state line or, or near your county, uh, and you want to see uh, any businesses that are, are doing this type of work in Virginia, you can find uh, local crafters, uh, millers, and, and such to, and find out and, and create your network and reach out to these folks and, and get help and see what they're doing in your neck of the woods. All right, next slide. So as we started taking down ash trees in the parks, we um, started accumulating logs and we weren't sure exactly how things were going to go, but we started making lumber with uh, some portable sawmills. And at that time, uh, we were, a Harrisonburg Downtown Renaissance director reached out and they were moving their space and they wanted a couple conference tables in their new office. So she reached out and she wanted some ash wood. So we went out, uh, Harrisonburg has a municipal golf course and we went out on the golf course and we cut our first tree down out there, found the biggest one along the cart path. And um, she introduced us to a local crafter and we hauled the mill just a couple miles just outside of town, had the, the, the log milled into lumber. And then Brad, the crafter, took it back downtown. So really the wood never really left the city limits. And next slide, he created beautiful conference tables for HDR. And just a side note here, we, I learned early on that you know, to honor the tree, we went ahead and took a picture of the tree that morning in the fog on the golf course, as it was standing there by the cart path. And then, you know, we honored that tree by, uh, in, you know, framing it in its own wood and it's hanging on the wall beside this space and in, uh, in their new space. So this this really got people engaged in the community. Uh, we uh, we uh, created several other conference tables, benches around town to get the word out as far as outreach and um, other city projects, but you know, you can only do so many city projects, budgets are tight, I understand. Uh, at this point, you know, we were bartering almost, you, you can barter, they learn to barter, you can, you can trade logs for milling services, you can trade lumber back to crafters for their services. So we've, we've given lumber to crafters for uh, different projects, and we've even given logs away for free milling services. So uh, another way to, to start up a program and, and manage your, your log pile and get stuff moving is the barter system. All right, next slide, please. So we were, you know, this is a typical log pile here, the ash trees that came down at, as they come down out of the parks. We don't, we don't manage a, a, lar a large log yard. We, we try to get logs moved and, and in, either into lumber or, or our main goal at that point was to get logs and material lumber back into our community so crafters could share and, uh, and get this stuff moving and, and get it purposed because we we couldn't we don't have the budget to process and, and keep uh, the lumber and, and for city projects so at that point the city of Harrisonburg sees you know the tree standing as a risk but once it's on the ground the, the city here um, determines that that's a, an asset now it's a it's a value to it and I can't just give it away to anybody so we met with our finance department and our purchasing department. And the solution for this was the city of Harrisonburg uses uh, public surplus. It's, a, it's one of the government online auction services, kind of like eBay. So for the last five years, I've been able to put up logs either as a lot like this. I started very cheap as a dollar and it runs for 10 days and uh, Anybody can bid on it and, and they can purchase these logs or we've even put up lumber. Uh, sometimes I work the auction backwards. If I know a crafter wants a certain log or a certain board, then we'll create that, that auction for a certain person. So we've moved a, a lot of logs, a lot of material this way, and it's, it's helped our program expand and get wood and the ash wood back into our community. Next slide, please. So that's turned into more of an outreach. And like I said, we don't have a large program or a large, a large log yard. So we just kind of move stuff. We keep wanting to move stuff. We have more, actually more lumber in inventory than logs at this point. But for another outreach program too, is you can do workshops in your in your um, community. We This was a very successful workshop. We partnered with 
a local contractor. We had two contractors team up and they quit their day job and started Rocktown Urban Wood. They're great guys. They bought some of our logs. They have ash to sell back to the community at retail now. So that they helped us with this uh, charcuterie board workshop. We partnered with HDR and JMU Dining Services. The chef came over, learned how to make a charcuterie board. Everybody got a free drink ticket. And th this is this uh, workshop has sold out now a couple of times. Some other workshops we have are birdhouse, uh, bee hotels, uh, hairpin table workshops. So we're getting a lot more requests to use our wood to get back into the community. And then we actually show our, our presentation at that point too, to the, the attendees to learn about our program. So again, again, it's just a continuing outreach to expand your program, to get more buy-in from your local um, your directors and city managers and, and um, stakeholders that, that wanna buy in to this. And remember, you know, that this would, our, our main goal for this is for nobody to breathe to go to our local landfill. So we're not paying tipping fees. So you can think about, you may not have a, a large budget, but, you know, you say, you know, your landfill is charging so much for tipping fees. So you can work everything backwards. And even with public surplus, uh, the revenue, we're, we're making a several thousand, five thousand dollars a year, but it goes back to the general fund. But again, I work that backwards and so it doesn't go right back to my budget. But then on the other end, I ask for uh, more when I'm, I'm, I'm preparing my new budget, then I'll, I'll ask for more on the front end of next year. So you can expand a program like that too. So next slide, please. So recently we had a phone call from a JMU professor. They heard about our program and the architectural design uh, professor started a pilot program at James Madison. They wanted to use some of our wood to teach uh, students how to use local materials. And they've had a couple projects now. It's been very successful. We're on year two for this. They're using wood, our wood out of our program. To, it's an outreach program. We, we have the, the portable mill as far as a demonstration for the students. And that's two purposes. The students get to learn about the portable mill. Plus, we're making material there on site that we can put back into our inventory. So they're making uh, creative wooden projects back to their community. So this, again, more outreach and, and people are recognizing this program. Next slide, please. And then so, you know, the next professor in the studio finds out the industrial design student, um, they, they're they making wooden bicycles out of ash and they're making instruments, drums and um, percussion instruments. And they even last, they um, this past semester, we took some wood and actually made an outdoor classroom area for local elementary school. So again, engage your community, let them know what you're doing. And it's, it's a complete buy-in and a lot of people get excited about this and it's a win-win and you can just build your program and keep your, your material moving that way. Next slide, please. Now that I'm with Public Works, we've engaged our engineers and our construction management team. This is a stream restoration project in the city of Harrisonburg. So when you have a contractor on site with a big piece of equipment and this large red oak has to come down it's standing dead. It's um, it, they're pulling the banks back for stream restoration, and it's a no-brainer to pull up on a trailer and a pickup truck and 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 a great big red oak log that we're going to get ready to slab this into um, slabs for conference tables. So it's pretty cool. Uh, next slide, please. And just to wrap up, uh, some supporting documents. If you work for local government, we were very fortunate at that time as we got started. Um, somebody not pushed us along uh, the city of Harrisonburg. We were revising our comprehensive plan in 2018, and we were able to get some strat strategies and objectives in that plan. So it, and then the year after uh, our city, we uh, drafted our first environmental action plan, and we were able to get language in that document as well. So our program supported from our city manager through our directors all the way down through our staff. So it's really what the driving force that has helped our program be so successful. And I think I'm right at my 10 minute mark. So thank you for your time.
Sorry, I could not find the hidden menu. I wanted to introduce Sean. Um, and I appreciate Sean coming on. I have, he's gonna talk about all of this, uh, his Camp Small Zero Waste Initiative. And uh, the reason I wanted him to go next is you got a wonderful view from Jeremy about how a, a municipality starts the urban wood process uh, by relying on community engagement, being creative through their, their bartering system, their uh, public education workshops um, for craft building, and, uh, and even, you know, highlighting their strategic planning process by getting city leadership support. Well, now we're going to move on to an even larger way in which the city um, shows leadership and, and vision for how to approach urban wood. And that's uh, how Camp Small got started. And Sean, if I recall correctly from our phone conversation, you pretty much have been building the whole urban wood uh, program. Uh, so I'm gonna let you take over. I'm gonna move next to your, to your next slide. Thanks, Bye. Catherine. Um, hi everyone. Nice to it's it's really nice to be here. Um, it's exciting to see so many so many people um, you know interested in starting these programs. It's um, you know for for all the um, reasons that Jeremy just mentioned, and I'm sure reasons that you're aware of that brought you brought you here today. You know you're aware of the the benefits and the the added value. Um, you know the sustainable mission. Um, and starting a program like this. So it's great to see that, um, you know, and I'm happy to be here to, to, to share how, how Baltimore City went about um, starting a starting their reutilization program. Um, so, and uh, uh, you could skip to the next slide, Catherine, thanks. Um, and and just, just to let everybody know, I'm really bad about um, kind of staying on track when I'm talking. So I'll probably go all over the place and I'll, probably uh, get to a slide where I've already talked about everything on that slide. So <laughs> forgive me at a time for being bad at that. Um, but uh, so in 2016, uh, Baltimore City finally got this program started. Um, I think the can had been kicked around for maybe like a decade or something. Um, you know, folks from the from the US Forest Service were, were really close to the, uh, the, the field station in Baltimore here. Uh, so folks from the field station, uh, folks from the um, Baltimore City's Office of Sustainability, um, and, and our Recreation and Parks, which houses our Division of Forestry and houses Camp Small within the Forestry Division. Um, you know, I've been trying to figure out how to start a program to capture the value. Um, Baltimore City is really fortunate in that we have a, a four and a half acre site that's been called Camp Small for 100 years, and it's been used for 100 years for dumping wood. Um, you know, when I was uh, 10 years before I started this job, I knew about this, this spot as the stump dump, and it was just a place that artists could, could walk into. Uh, the gate was open. No one was here. Uh, you could just walk in and, and grab a chunk of wood. Um, you know, people would come and cut firewood. Uh, it was sort of unattended in the no man's land, and the stuff would just pile up, you know, until there were, were tens of thousands of of, um, of wood debris that was all mixed, um, chips mixed with logs, mixed with branches, and and then the city would have to, you know, contract somebody to come and take some of it away to free up some space to continue dumping here. Um, so, you know, when 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 they got together. Um, Somebody in the Office of Sustainability, a gentleman named Andy Cook, uh, wrote up a proposal to our Innovation Fund Committee. Um, the Innovation Fund is housed within the Baltimore City Finance Department, and it's part of the it's part of the Mayor's Office as well. And it's a program that awards awards money to agencies starting innovative programs with a return on revenue. Um, so if they could show through a business plan a five year payback, um, they could get awarded. The sum of money that they need to start their program. Um, and that's how this program started. It started with a $100,000 innovation fund loan that uh, brought me on board and got me some rental equipment to, um, to screen through piles, like 20-year-old 
piles of decomposing woody material to create a compost. Um, we were able to sell that compost, um, pay back a bulk of the, the loan. Uh, we had five years to pay it back between the compost sale and um, and and then um, our utility company put a substation here at Camp Small. So they took they took an acre and a bunch of woodland to build a substation. Um, and when I became aware of that 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 was going to happen, I you know walked to those that forest and and found a good a lot of good usable uh, timber possible timber and worked with our electric company to um, to utilize those logs. It was about you know, 120, 140 logs from uh, from about 60, 60 trees. There were walnut, poplar, ash. And um, and then I approached our capital department to see if um, if uh, you could skip to the next slide. Yeah. To see if there was, um, you know, any any upcoming projects that could use some some lumber. And uh, we, you know, in our capital department said that they're they were just kickstarting the first of a series of uh, of new and and renovated wellness centers, um, and that they had budgeted a hundred thousand dollars to clad the interior of the building with lumber. And I was like, "Well, I've got I've got every bit of that lumber that you need." And um, I found a local sawmill. This is illustrated in these photos. They they cut the boards um, and we put them into the building. Um, you can see a picture at the bottom there, of the gymnasium with, uh, with the lumber on the walls. So that's, you know, 20 foot, 20 foot lengths there. Um, and all throughout the, the facility, it was like 17,000 board feet. Uh, it saved the department $70,000. Um, we paid back that innovation fund loan and, uh, and it really set us up for success. I mean, you know, we did something that Baltimore hadn't done before probably not a lot of cities have done before a, you know a project to that scale uh, all in-house um out of our own lumber uh so um you know at the time i didn't have any any equipment nothing to process in-house the lumber i was trying to, or the, the timber i was trying to um to find local sawmills that wanted it that's a real challenge with urban wood um but you know, was able to find some smaller boutique kind of operations uh, that would come in and select some logs and buy it. We had sort of started on the same thing that Jeremy was mentioning about the, the public surplus, and we tried some auctions, and it it didn't really work very well. And, and that might be because we don't we don't have a lot of people in the area that are capable of of processing um, logs to to lumber. Um, so it didn't really work out for us uh, selling auction logs. Um, which kind of encouraged me to try to figure out, okay, well, how do we do it in-house? How do we, how do we process the logs in-house? Um, I was able to apply for a grant. You can go to the next slide, please, Catherine, um, through American Forests and, um, and, and got a grant from American Forests, a $40,000 grant that bought us our sawmill, our, our wood miser, um, got us the money for a kiln and a firewood splitter. And we were able to just start processing some product. Um, I was all by myself, so I couldn't really use the equipment. <laughs> um, but I but I used it as a catalyst to to get to get somebody to come help me, um, and and that worked. Um, you know, so so now we're 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 still small. We're small and mighty. We're two person operation. Um, and uh, you can go to the next slide, please, Kathleen. Um, and we, you know, currently we work with, um, school groups to do outdoor classrooms. Uh, we do play spaces throughout the city. Um, we, we process about, um, about 15,000 board foot of kiln dried lumber a year, uh, with our dehumidification kiln. Um, we probably process about twice that in, in rough sawn grain lumber. Um, we put a lot of logs, whole logs into use throughout, throughout the city schools, throughout community groups, um, public space projects, um, as play, as sitting areas. Um, we do products where we do outdoor furniture, stuff that we can do out of green wet lumber. Um, so we'll do benches, uh, raised bed kits. Um, we work with a lot of communities and, and city farms on doing 
very large, you know, 40 to 60 uh, raised bed uh, uh, farms throughout urban farms. Um, we use our white oak. Uh, when stuff comes in, you know, we sort it. We keep everything really well sorted here. It's it's 9,000 tons annually that Camp Small gets in, in material uh, that comes here that, that the two of us sort and separate, um, that we sort around our facility uh, so that we have, you know, designated piles for each species. Um, you know, we wax the ends of our logs when we're using them uh, for longevity. And, um, and we process about a thousand tons of the 9,000 um, annually per year. So, um, you know, we've gotten to where we're, 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 we're achieving more than we expected to achieve as a two person operation. Um, and we're gearing up to try to expand um, through the expansion of equipment, which would lead to, um, um, you know, higher revenue that allows us to expand our personnel. Um, and we're going to ease into the expansion of personnel through a workforce development training program. Um, you can skip to the next slide, please, Kyle. Um, and let's see, maybe, uh, yeah, that one's good. <laughs> um, and that will, uh, uh, you can go back one, sorry. <laughs> uh, and that will, um, the idea with the, or the workforce uh, development training program is it's a paid training program, um, a living wage to, um, you know, Baltimore city residents, employment barriers, having trouble finding jobs and gaining skills. Um, so we would, we would be able to provide, provide them um, heavy equipment training certification. Uh, we can provide them with uh, wood shop training, basically a one-on-one. Uh, my colleague, Nick Oster is, um, you know, wood shop teacher and uh, ex wood shop teacher, because now he's a camp small employee. Um, and, uh, and so we'd be providing them those skills as well as basic forestry skills. Um, and hopefully that'll go a long way, you know, for them. But um, our plan currently is to piggyback on a nonprofit that already has a workforce development program in place. Um, and they would just come over here for, uh, for you know, extra training, six month period of, of training with us. And then we would pull from, take from that pool uh, for permanent employees uh, to increase our, our, our permanent staff. Um, you know, things that we hope to get into uh, very soon um, is uh, Baltimore City is looking for to do a citywide composting operation within the next three years. Uh, that'll eat up a lot of our excess material. You know, I said we, we do about a thousand tons a year of that 9,000 tons. So a lot of the stuff is just um, not suitable for those those higher use lumber, those products. Um, so, you know, trying to come up with a plan on how to utilize that lower waste is, is very important um, um, for, for many reasons, but, um, you know, a composting operation would get rid of, of that for its carbon, a citywide composting operation, because um, that's a lot of material. But also biochar, you know, we're, we're looking into, into doing biochar production, um, you know, as a part of forestry, uh, we're very connected with, you know, planting the trees, uh, maintaining the trees, and now we've got this program to utilize them when they come down. So we're full circle here at Baltimore City Forestry. Um, so a biochar would would go into the tree plantings, and uh, and hopefully, you know, as as we're all suffering through climate change and, and our white oak trees are and, and lots of other trees, um, that would be hopefully a, an enhancement that could, you know, increase um, uh, the life of, of those of those trees. Um, and let's see, oh gosh, that was really quick and I probably missed a whole lot of stuff. So hopefully, um, hopefully there's lots of questions that come through because uh, I love talking about this stuff. I could talk about it all day long. Uh, I'm sure my, my wife and kids are tired of me talking about it, but you guys might not be. Um, so uh, yeah, ask away at the end. Uh, again, I'm really glad to be here. Here's some of our partners. I didn't talk about our partners. We have great partners. Um, uh, uh, one of our main buyers of our material, you know, it's I, I, like Jeremy was saying, you know, you, starting this program and not having any like any product other than raw material and trying to reach out there and find out who's out there and who wants this stuff. I mean, I really found out quickly who was out there uh, in the wood product 
um, realm in our region and why our stuff uh, didn't meet their needs. And in learning that, I learned what I needed to do to our stuff to meet their needs, uh, where the best markets were and how to get into them. Um, and that's gone a long way. And, you know, one of our big buyers of our, of our lumber and our kiln dried lumber is a, is a furniture company called Sandtown Furniture. They're fantastic. They're right here in Baltimore City. Um, they do a lot of work, uh, beautiful work, and, and uh, pretty much 100% of their, their material comes from our, our, our lumber. So, um, you know, good partners and good relationships. It's a lot. It's a lot of this business. So thanks very much. Okay, um, I think I am ah trying to bring down my little menu. It's not working. Can you all hear me? Uh, Andy, do you hear me or am I muted? Oh, jeepers, come on. All right, okay, good, I am unmuted. So, I will go back to sharing. Sorry, I've used GoToWebinar in the past and Zoom is just not as easy for me to maneuver through easily when leading people through a discussion. Okay, so Andy Trotter, he has um, been in this business for a, a, a long time. West Coast Arborist is where he works as the Vice President of Field of Operations. As you see on the screen, they started 51 years ago. And uh, as a family owned business. And it was 25 years ago that Street Tree Revival started. John Mahoney, who was going to be a part of our presentation, um, if I recall correctly, he's the son of the owner of West Coast Arborists. And he oversees the whole Street Tree Revival program, um, finding a way to salvage trees and turn it into lumber, live wood, edge wood slabs, and other. Um, high quality products that people can use. And Andy's also a big member of the Urban Wood Network. So he will also uh, be joining me um, and you're free to say at any point in time, Andy, uh, what value the Urban Wood Network is to everyone who, whether or not they are well established in the urban wood business at the moment. So I'm going to open your slide presentation. And let's see, slideshow. Hmm. Trying to move it. Well, thank you while you get sorted through to that. Uh, and, and like the other presenters, I can, I can talk a lot about the Urban Wood, uh, you know, program or urban wood in general. I, uh, even as far back as high school, love to work with wood and, uh, you know, I'm an arborist. And so I, I started with uh, West Coast Arborist a little over 40 years ago, actually. And uh, I'm that guy that like dragged a log home from the job site and got myself an Alaskan chain mill and uh, started making some slabs actually, which, uh, a couple I actually have in my garage today is is workbenches. So yeah, anytime you want to go ahead and jump into the first slide, that would be great. I'm still seeing your uh, introductory slide. Okay, why don't you talk? I, I'm having difficulty. Okay, sure, no problem. So, like I say, I, I started uh, playing around with some logs that I brought off of job sites about 40 years ago. And uh, our company, we you know, have grown over the years. Today, we serve about 350 different uh, municipalities and public agencies, um, primarily in California, but also in uh, Arizona. And through that work, we do all aspects of uh, urban forestry management. So we'll be doing everything from uh, tree inventories to planting, pruning, removing the trees, plant health care, 
uh, and, and those related services, again, to public agencies were kind of their partner for whatever parts of the program uh, they need our assistance in, we're there to help them accomplish that. Um, through that effort, we remove a lot of trees. Uh, fortunately, we also plant a lot of trees. Uh, but where does all the material go? Um, in 1992, I was introduced to our state urban forester uh, for Cal Fire, who was, um, you know, showing me the first wood miser I'd ever seen. And I felt like Tim Allen versus my chainsaw, bigger, better toys. I was ready to go play with one of those. And they had a, uh, a grant sharing program with those machines and some uh, dehumidification kilns at the time. And so I, I uh, went ahead and uh, you know promoted our company to go ahead and get one of those loaner programs and we did. And we got started and we started milling wood and, and sharing it with our customers. And it, and it went along as a great public relations program for the next, I'd say about 15 years. Um, then about that time, uh, the owner's son, John Mahoney, who unfortunately isn't with us today, uh, started to become a teenager. And uh, dad had him go work at the wood yard to make sure he could earn his keep. And uh, he quickly fell in love with the idea of the urban woods. So John Mahoney is the inspiration of what's become our street tree revival program. And uh, tons of enthusiasm has really brought the program to a a pretty neat place today where we're really starting to take off. I'm hoping you can get to the slides. Yeah, I don't, it, um, for some reason, it, it says I'm sharing, but then it's paused. I think it has something to do with how your slide presentation was sent over to me. Uh, if you so wanna maybe even check a couple questions from the other speakers, uh, maybe I can go into my, um, computer and find the presentation and figure out how to share. Yeah. If you uh, want to try that route, you'll end up having to give me share permission once I get my presentation open. Well, I've changed you to host. And... Oh, you have already changed me to host? Yes. Okay. Are you able to look at any of the questions? Yes, let me ask I'm, a question. I'm going to need a minute or two. Uh, and no, I'm sorry for this. It was a a website that I was directed to from uh, Andy's staff instead of having the actual file. So I couldn't I'm put sorry. it. Yeah. I you had um, it. A question is, do any of the programs that have been discussed so far create lumber that can be used for the building of a home or any other type of standing structure? Uh, I can take a stab at that, uh, or uh, at least talk about, we do not. Um, as far as like, you know, when you think of like structural um, building, uh, you generally you're thinking of like, you know, two by fours and two by sixes and, and pine. I think like, you know, something that becomes an issue is, is cost. Um, you know, generally that like, you know, dimensional two buys for, for building um, are made out of, you know, low grade pine and, and it's, it's straight, it's got flex, it's good for, it's good for structural stuff and it's really cheap. Um, it's hard for like programs like this to, to compete with those costs. And, and we're sort of, we're using wood that has higher, would it be having, you know, higher value than that? for um, a lower purpose. So it generally doesn't happen. I mean, we'll, we'll do stuff where it's like some timber kind of framing uh, structural things. If somebody's like looking to build and they're trying to get eight by eights, 10 by tens, things like that. And we'll do that because that's generally done out of like a white oak. Um, so, so for those things, yes. But as far as producing two by fours and two by sixes for typical building practices, no. Um, is I should see if Randall Williams is on because Randall Williams owns Fireside Lumber out of um, Eflin, North Carolina. And 
he's in the process of as a portable saw no not a portable he has his own sawmill he's in the process of wanting to create um accessory dwelling units kits three different types of kits and using all of the lumber that he urban lumber he finds in the durham area so fireside lumber company i'll put that in the chat check out um his website because he even details a 10-step process of how he's approaching getting the lumber uh, or getting you know collecting the urban wood and then moving it through the process to become lumber i can also aid that question a little bit uh just because um lumber for a building has to be graded and that's the big barrier. Um, normally graded lumber has uh, pretty strict criteria and, and it is expensive in order to jump into that world. Also, you know, I think it would be hard for us in our, um, you know, more of a boutique level of, of uh, milling and lumber to compete with the, uh, the big players out there, right? And so I think it was, I, I'm not sure if it was Sean or, that said it, but uh, I think our wood also has a higher value and that more connected to the community value uh, when we get into the urban wood uh, stuff. So I, can you all see my screen now? I'm sorry. Yes, we got right. it. So there's a picture of John Mahoney. If you guys ever uh, are interested, you can check out Street to Revival. He does YouTube stuff and uh, he's just one of the most positive people I've ever met. Uh, I was really excited when he caught the bug because what it did was give, uh, you know, a lot of energy into our program and and with his father and our growing business, uh, give us the opportunity to grow what we're doing uh, with the Street Tree Revival program. So I kind of ordered my slides and and you tell me how, how I'm doing on time because I know we stalled here for a bit. No I kind of uh, am focusing on our wood recycling yards. We actually have two of them, one in Northern California and one in the um, that's in the Central Valley and outside of Stockton, and one in Southern California uh, in Ontario, which is inland from the greater Los Angeles area. So I kind of went through the flow of wood coming in, and we have it coming in from job sites all over the place. We take material um, to recycling places all over the place. We track every load of material that comes off of all our job sites because our customers, the cities we work for, are looking to track that for uh, several different state mandates that we have. So the big thing when stuff comes in is it, it gets dumped and you got to figure out how to sort it and deal with it. Um, uh, to the ability we can at the Ontario yard, we try to bring in mostly just uh, logs that are usable logs for either firewood or lumber. And then everything else becomes a, uh, a bit of a waste product for us that we've got to figure out how to deal with. Um, once the logs come in, um, we start sorting them and sizing them. Uh, this picture is actually of our um, Northern California yard, the Top right is a is an older picture of one of our yards in well the one in Ontario, and uh, you know logs are coming in. You can see tags on some of those logs. It's a effort that we have uh, for the field crews to actually tag the logs with the species and uh, location where they come from, and so that's uh, added value of course. Uh, but from there we're taking them and sorting them. Uh, we're, we're also cutting them to, to uniform lengths and, uh, and, and getting ready to deck uh, by species. Uh, important step that I also heard uh, one of the other speakers talk about is sealing the ends of the logs. We use a product called Anchor Seal, and that um, waxy material on the ends of the logs will slow down the drying. Uh, this actually looks like some eucalyptus logs here, and they can mill into some great material, but uh, when the ends of logs start to crack, you can lose a tremendous uh, percentage of your potential lumber because those cracks go deep into the wood, 
And a lot of times they, they might not look like big cracks when you first mill, but by the time you finish drying, now that crack might have gone a foot or two into that end of the log. So that's a really big deal. Here you can see uh, more tags on logs. Um, we've done different things to try to track uh, ID over the years. Uh, at one point we were, uh, you know, color painting uh, with different color schemes, the ends of the logs to readily identify the species. Um, but these days we've moved to the tags. Uh, and once those tags come off, when we mill them, we actually enter them into a, uh, a log or a tree uh, urban wood uh, database. Uh, the trace program that's offered by Cambium Carbon is the one that we use. Uh, and again, at the top right there, you can see um, lots of, of uh, decks of logs. They're all decked out by species. But then there's the question of what do you do with the rest? And so certainly we're pulling out all the pearls that we can to try and make best use of it in, in urban lumber. That's our favorite use. But there's a lot of other byproduct. Um, and I think almost anybody, whether you're private or public, you're going to have some form of waste that you have to deal with. So coming up with a byproduct or, uh, you know, to avert having it be waste uh, is, is the key to the strategy. So um, this is our um, yard in, in uh, Stockton again. And here it's actually getting ground up. We have uh, a couple of big grinders, um, 750 horsepower and 1,000 horsepower. And then top right picture, you can see a trommel screen going. So the material on the, I don't know, I may be backwards on your guys' view, but the, the picture of the pile of stuff on the, on the uh, my left side of the screen is all ground up. And then as soon as it goes through the grinders and those trommel screens, then it's immediately uh, taken to a, another vendor nearby us who bags it and sells it in those uh, big back box stores as different kinds of mulch products. Um, in Ontario, our focus is actually uh, more in the firewood direction. And so we uh, have a partner that we've been working with literally for since the owner of our company was in high school, um, which is really when he started his business uh, when he was uh, still in high school. And, and uh, that partner uh, makes it all into firewood. It's an amazing firewood operation that they have. Uh, being California and a high-end uh, clientele and out of Orange County, uh, they sell out of that wood every year, and it's a tremendous amount of material they go through that way. So uh, I'm usually trying to grab logs from his pile, and I think he might be trying to grab logs from our pile all the time. But uh, at the end of the day, we have more than we have time to mill. So uh, someday I think we'll have less fires and and more lumber, I'm looking forward to that. Our total company capacity, uh, we're, we're running through about 800 tons a day of, of um, debris coming from our collective job sites. So it's a whole lot of stuff to recycle. Um, once we you know, uh, get them decked and, and we're ready to go off to the mill, um, here we're, we're, this is a LT70 at this yard. We also have a, uh, uh, Lucas slabbing, uh, mill, uh, up in, in, uh, Stockton. We have another, uh, 70, uh, wood miser and a WM1000, which is the big bandsaw that runs on railroad tracks with a, uh, I think it's a 60, 72 inch wide, uh, throat to it. So it'll do great big slabs beautifully. Um, you can also see them, they coat everything with, um, you know, the ends are, of course, already sealed with anchor seal, but any wood that has any possible bug issue is also sealed with um, uh, timbor, uh, basically a salty borax derivative to stop wood boring beetles from getting into the wood. Um, if we think there might be already insects in it, then we'll actually use a product called Boracare, which is just a, uh, another borax derivative that's better at penetrating into the wood. 
And um, I'm not going a whole lot into uh, some of the milling operations or marketing, but before we uh, send anything to a customer, it's also going to get a heat treat and a dehumidification or a vacuum kiln. As we uh, close it out, we're, we put it to rest in, in the shade. Um, on the one side of the screen there, you can see one of our, our Miller uh, Sawyers, Edder. He's an awesome guy. Um, but uh, we're, we're trying to do as perfect of stacking as possible. And this building is, I don't know, it's, a, it's over 200 feet long and uh, 20 feet high and about, I think, 40 feet deep. And uh, you can see the lumber is wrapped with a, a lumber wrap product. It's all about slowing down the drying. And, uh, and it's open to the north side. So um, doesn't matter where you're at, build your shade structures uh, with an opening to the north side and they'll catch the most shade. So, um, uh, you know, from there, you know, we do go uh, downstream to uh, uh, kilns, uh, uh, depending on the end use product. And, uh, and then we have a showroom as well. If you visit Street Tree Revival, um, you, you can easily find them and, and learn more about what we're doing there. So I know uh, between the stall time and everything I've gone over, but I do want to, uh, as, as we're being said, uh, a shout out for the Urban Wood Network. Um, I think I've learned so much by networking with other people in this industry, starting with our own local uh, state uh, urban foresters. But um, now that I'm working with the Urban Wood Network at a, at a national level, uh, I'm learning all the time. Sean, I saw one of your partners being Cambium Carbon. Uh, Paul Timmons was actually uh, doing a tour with me um, yesterday uh, at our yard up in Ontario. Uh, we have so many logs, I think they're interested in maybe buying some logs from us. But, uh, and, and it's just something we're all willing to share uh, back and forth with each other so we can all learn. And that's the reason to join the network is to learn and, and also maybe build alliances. If you're only doing part of the program, well, how do you build your partners uh, for, so you don't have to do everything yourself? Other than that, I just wanna say thank you for your time and available for questions. Would you return me as the, or turn it back to me? If as I the... can figure it out, I will sh <laughs> stop sharing. Thank and you. then I probably, is that all I have to do or do I have to give you control? Uh, let's see, I can share my- uh, I got a toolbar across my bottom, but I'm not seeing- um, I believe it was- I'm not well, seeing... It's okay. I'll, I'll go on. Um, I'm also not a Zoom guy. I'm more of a Teams guy. <laughs> uh, I think I went through uh, the participants or the hosts. So if you select on me, you could make me the host. I'm, I'm perusing around looking for where I can give away. But, the uh, so uh, Jen had her hand raised. I don't know if I'm able to judge. Hmm, I had, there we are. No, I'm not able, if you type in your question in the Q&A field, I'll be able to read it since I've lost control. Uh, I'm not able to unmute you, Jen. Uh, but I know what I was finding from your all's talk, one, you, you know, you had the challenge of finding somebody who can take your lumber. And you also had what was interesting, the city of Harrisonburg, the auction process worked well for auctioning off logs, but then it wasn't working well at Camp Small. So you have to get to know your buyers. Can you, can you all talk more about how you get to know your target audience, to know with the urban wood you're bringing in and you're milling it, um, what did you have to do to find out how you have to approach your program to make sure it meets everybody's needs? Yes. We started by networking. 
and and literally uh, John Mahoney and our program uh, administrative uh, person went to Camp Small uh, two or three years ago, or maybe at the beginning of the pandemic for was, one of those urban wow. wood uh, academies. Six years, six years ago, maybe. <laughs> Time flies, okay. I know, I know. So anyway, I'd heard about that. I'd been invited by the Forest Service, and I, you know, I said let these people go rather than myself. And and uh, and through that, they met, you know, several people, including like let's say the folks from Room and Board or Taylor Guitar. Um, it took a couple of years, and actually through the pandemic, Taylor Guitar came out and and went to our yards and started, uh, you know, looking through the wood and looking for the characteristics that fit the needs for their business. And they found um, uh, not the kind of ash that you guys have primarily, one called it's green ash, shamal ash in particular. Uh, and they debuted during the pandemic this uh, new guitar that sold so well, they, uh, they'd slow down their marketing. And, and so that's probably our biggest success <laughs> that we've had so far. But it, it takes a lot of uh, putting yourself out there and, um, you know, and networking. Uh, in order to connect those dots. Uh, we also do a lot of the outdoor classrooms for schools. That's a wonderful way to do it these days. Uh, big logs and we just break them down and, and uh, do that. Our showroom and our slab sell pretty well in the showroom. Collectively last year, we did about a million dollars in sales. Yeah, I'll agree too. The, the networking is great and always up for a great field trip. Uh, we were able to go to Baltimore and see Sean's operation and spend the night and go over to um, San, what was the company, Sean? Sandtown? Yeah, Sandtown. Um, San mm -hmm. San so, mm -hmm. Just go go meet folks and kick some dirt around and then see what you can bring home and what works best in uh, your region. And I think most people in the network are really happy to share. I've done tours of other mills and, you know, we, we certainly learn so much from each other. So um, another question I had, because uh, this definitely came from a person, I don't know if Aaron Reese was actually able to join this conversation, but he's in the city of Wilmington, and he's want, he's been wanting to create an urban wood collection yard for a while, and over the phone, before I even invited you all to be a part of this presentation, he had said, you know, maybe I need to get, you know, the city leadership involved. And Jeremy, it and actually for Jeremy and Sean, it sounds like you all didn't have to approach the city. The city um, started this on their own with wanting to find more sustainable ways to uh, address issues. I mean, I know Sean, you were using the Office of Sustainability to get a loan, but to what extent were you all having to present to the city? We have this waste problem help us or was the city coming to you um and i'm just trying to help for those who might have resistance from city leadership what words of advice do you have for them um so yeah the yeah that's like it's 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 kind of like non-stop you know i mean we're, we're constantly going to you know um high ups in the city uh, and officials uh, pushing something or another. Um, you know, right now, the, the thing is, um, is, you know, with our with our nature playgrounds and uh, um, trying to figure out, you know, whether or not we need to go about it a different way with certification. Um, so, you know, there's, there's always something I think, I think what's important is, is, um, the communication, um, you know, when the program started, it was it was sort of championed by, you know, by a few a few individuals within city government. Um, then when I came in, you know, there was only sort of a, a real kind of loose idea of of a direction to go in, um, and it didn't really work out most most of the direction that was sort of given to me on on how to make the program succeed was was by um by selling our logs to a local sawmill and when i started the local sawmill basically was like we're not coming to pick up your logs you got to bring them to us 
and we're not really interested in them because they're going to have a lot of metal in them. Um, and so, you know, that kind of tanked. Um, and I had to kind of form, formulate a new, a new program, which has worked really well. Um, you know, a key thing is just starting off really slow. You know, I mean, that, that's really worked for us. Um, it's allowed us time to figure out those markets, make those connections, um, spend lots of time kind of knowing the community. Um, but, uh, you know, things that we had to do right away were, were, you know, work side by side with our legal department on all things. Um, you know, we were putting pricing on everything. So that all requires law. Um, there was risk management that we had to bring in because, um, sorry, my colleagues uh, blowing the dust off of them. <laughs> um, but uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, we had to work with risk management. We have a, a firewood collection program here where people can pay. Uh, an annual dues and cut from a, a, a select pile of, of wood. And that was put in because, you know, people were coming in here unauthorized and doing that. And so when I started the program, a lot of people were upset about the fact that I was telling them they can't do that anymore. So I started a program to, to allow them to continue to do that, but they have to sign a waiver. Um, not a big deal, but I had to work with risk and law to get that done. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time downtown with uh, the head of purchasing. Um, you know, she was, I got really lucky and the head of purchasing at the time was, a, was um, you know, a, a real big supporter of, of what we were trying to do. And, you know, it was like I had her on speed dial, basically. Um, so, you know, the, the kind of work we're doing is the kind of work that once it's explained, um, basically anybody's going to support it. I mean, they'd be fools not to. So, um, you know, it's just, it's just explaining it. It's just getting it in their ear, letting them know, translating what the benefits are, knowing who you, your audience is that you're talking to. You know, for some people, just the environmental benefits are going to go a long way. For other people, they're going to want to hear about the economics, you know. Um, so knowing, knowing who you're talking to, um, because this work, it's, it's successful on every single level. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, just, uh, keeping those dialogues open, finding out who your champions are and, um, and, and making sure the people who need to know, know about it. Yeah. Jeremy, did you have anything to add? Yeah, just additionally, just be persistent. We were fortunate. We had a change in leadership, um, new parks director, old parks director had been here 40 years and, uh, you know, a new director comes in, new city manager, just, you know, have your ducks in a row and be ready to go and, and tell your story to the, the new person with local government. You know, a lot of times there's there's changeover um, and and be wet, ready to sell your pitch to your new your new boss or new leaders and um, just stay with it. And sometimes things will click and uh, the puzzle pieces will start to fall together. Okay, and for grants, you there was a state grant. That's unique, uh, that particular program for Baltimore. But, and, you know, every state's going to have their own sort of grant programs to go through. But are there any federal grants that you all know of that people can take advantage of to piggyback on their state pursuits? They're late now, but the, but the, the one innovation grant is probably going to come back out. Um, I think that comes out annually or has been recently. Um, and that's for the U.S. Postal Service. Yeah, and that's 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 the that's the one that really uh, I'm sure there are lots. I mean, you know, we got a we got a grant from American Forest that was forty thousand dollars, and that was the relief grant. They award that regularly, and that usually goes to tree plantings. But but um, but American Forest is you know really really wanting to support this movement. So you know I think there's opportunity there. But uh, but yeah, the wood innovation grant from the Forest Service is a big one for for starting this kind of work. Um, and uh, and whenever applying for grant, partner, partner, partner. You know the more the more you can show the partnerships you're making, which you're gonna be making. So you know figure out who they are and get them excited and get them in on your grant application and a letter of support from them. That goes a long way. Okay. Well, I really appreciate this. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions that people have. If not, we can 
a germ. <laughs> but uh, I probably, if people ask if they can get in touch with you, well, oh, I don't have my website. I can't. I was going to share everybody the website for everyone um, who's on the panel, but uh, Camp Small, West Coast Arborist, and City of Harrisonburg, that's how you can get in touch with our panelists, or just contact me and I will send you their emails if you have other questions. Um, sorry I'm volunteering you if uh, people do have questions, but uh, this is really helpful, and I hope uh, at least one attendee is able to find success in within the next two years of starting their own collection yard for their community. <laughs>